In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. So we'd like to welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, we'd like to begin our wonderful conversation among friends and family members by inviting one of the key family members to be with us, and that is Mary Most Holy. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We also call Mary, invoke Mary, and the Hail Holy Queen is, Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Beautiful title. Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's say the prayer to Mary, the one that she loves most. And that prayer that we say to Mary is the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, <clears throat> the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we always want to invite our spiritual guide or director to be with us. Our spiritual guide or director is, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many different titles. The Holy Spirit is known also as the Paraclete. The Holy Spirit is known as the Gift of gifts, the Holy Spirit is known as the Counselor. He's also known as the Consoler. The Holy Spirit is the mutual bond of love between the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul reminds us, he teaches us how to pray. He's our, he's our interior master. As St. Paul says in the Romans, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. So let's sing to the Holy Spirit as we enter into our Perseverance family conversation. And let's sing as such. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Ignatius, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Saint Gabriel. Pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Scholastica, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 
Amen. So once again, we, we welcome you to our Perseverance family. And as always, I promise to pray for all of you and ask you to pray for me. I will pray for you in a special way in the greatest prayer in the world. The greatest prayer in the world, my friends, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to place all of you on, uh, on the altar. I'll be celebrating the Mass at 6 p.m. today. And I'll be placing you on the altar so that when I lift up the chalice and I lift up the paten, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, I'll be lifting you all up to God. And I'll pray that God would bless you with peace, joy, long life, and eternal life. I also pray for your intentions as well as for your family members. So I, I like to just remind you of uh, these prayers because the greatest gift we can give for each other is God. And we give God to each other when we're praying for each other. So pray for me as well as invite you to pray for all the people. Pray for all the people that are in our Perseverance family. Invite others. Invite others to be with us as we uh, we pray for the gift of perseverance uh, in our spiritual life so that we can make it to heaven. And I think we should remind ourselves frequently while we're here. This is principle and foundation. We are here to know God, love God, and serve God in this life so as to get to heaven. As Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So let's pray for each other that we, um, that we uh, make it to heaven. You know, That's uh, why we're here. We make it to heaven and we try to be a bridge by which our children and our family members can make it to heaven. So that's, uh, that's uh, some words of comfort and com consolation for, for all of us. Now, I mentioned this yesterday, and I'd like to repeat it today, is um, uh, tomorrow which is uh, Thursday, February 11th, which happens to be the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes. Uh, I'm going to be starting a course on consecration to Mary. And it's going to be, the reason being I've been working with, over the past couple of years, I've been working with uh, a group, very important group, called Couples for Christ which was found in the Philippines a few years back and is spread all over the world. And Couples for Christ, also as Singles for Christ, there are various branches of it, has as its purpose to unite couples, families, to be united in Christ. In other words, to foster family unity, knowing that the family is very important. Family is the domestic church. Uh, John Paul II says it's the basic building block of society. And as the family goes is the way the world goes, as John Paul II points out. So I've been working with uh, this group. Uh, Tofi Jetarain is the head of the Couples for Christ in the United States. And um, he, um, we've been working together as a, uh, as a team to try to fortify this uh, group, Couples for Christ. So I'm going to be giving the talk to them. And they have members all throughout the country, even outside the country. So they'll be logging in to my Facebook page, as you're doing right now. But uh, invite you also to become part of uh, this uh, Marian Consecration Group. So of, of, of the seven days of the week, 
Uh, this uh, talk will only be given on, on, when, on, on Thursdays. It'll be given on Thursdays from tomorrow, from tomorrow all the way up to March 25th. Okay, so we'll be starting tomorrow. That'll be February 11th. It'll take us up to will take us up to March 25th, which happens to be the feast day of the Annunciation. And it's a beautiful time because you probably know that next week, Wednesday, next week, Wednesday, <clears throat> we enter into the holy season of uh, Lent with Ash Wednesday. So next Wednesday is actually Ash Wednesday. So it'll be um, Thursday, the six Thursdays up to March 25th. Now, what, uh, what is the textbook that we're going to be using? Sure, you, many of you have probably already, already consecrated yourself to God through the Blessed Virgin Mary. But it's always a good idea to renew that consecration. There are many types. There's that of St. Louis de Montfort. There's uh, Colby. There's Father Mike Gately. There's a lot of different forms of consecration. But uh, about four years ago, I published uh, another form of consecration published by Sophia Press. And this is what I published. This is my uh, claim to fame, so to speak. And it's a uh, total consecration, beautiful cover, isn't it? Total consecration through the mysteries of the rosary. And you can see Mary holding the rosary. And below it says meditations to prepare for total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And yours truly, Father Ed Brome. And, uh, you know, this consecration, it's a little bit different than the others in the sense that uh, you simply go through the mysteries of the rosary. So you're going to be meditating. All of you pray the rosary, I'm sure. But this is an opportunity to go really, really deep into the mysteries, which you have the biblical passage, and then there's a running commentary in each passage. And then what I strongly encourage is to talk to Mary from your heart. To talk to Mary from your heart. So I want you to pray the rosary, but talk to Mary from your heart. Mary is your mother. Mary cares for you. Mary loves you. Mary's going to help you. Okay, some are asking where can I purchase the book? You can get it from you can get it from uh, Sophia Press or Amazon. If you're close, you can come to the parish. If you're um, not too far away, you can come to the parish, St. Peter Chanel. You can actually purchase a copy here. So uh, as I mentioned, a couple of you are asking where can you get it? Uh, Amazon.com. Uh, also, Sophia Press. And, oh, you can come here to St. Peter Chanel. But this is the text, and it's the consecration <clears throat> is very easy, rather the preparation, because I lay it out. I explain uh, exactly what you're supposed to do. And another way, you want, you want to be spending time with Mary. You want to be spending time with Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, every day. And it's somewhat like my spiritual exercises program in the sense that I want you to make a holy hour with Mary. You know, um, you can holy hour with Mary. So if we really love someone, really love someone, then 
we want to spend time with that person. So we really love someone, we want to spend time with that person. Okay, so uh, there we have it. Uh, you can pick this up at the parish uh, from 10 to 5. If you have $15, that's what we usually ask. So uh, it's worth uh, it's worth purchase, purchasing, and um, I've written already published three books. This is uh, this is uh, basically who I am, and I'm oblate of the Virgin Mary, and I really believe that we get to know and love Mary through the Rosary. Mary said at Fatima six times, "Pray the Rosary." So here's the beautiful cover. Beautiful cover. So, there we have it. There we have it. Now, as always, we have a lot to cover. Uh, we have a lot to cover. So we have, uh, we're, we're still reading through the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going through the gospel of St. Mark. And, uh, as you know, as you know, that when we arrive at the life of a saint, I try to give you uh, some ideas on the saint. And the saint that we celebrate is someone that puts into practice the gospel. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, speaking about the communion of saints, says that the saints can help us in two ways. The saints can pray for us. Don't forget the saints are alive. The saints are in heaven. The saints are with God. The saints are powerful. The saints can take our prayers and bring our prayers to God. We believe in the communion of saints. And also the saints have left us a beautiful model for us to follow. A beautiful model. And the saints, they spur us on so that we ourselves can pursue holiness. Never forget that you are called to become a saint, and I'm called to become a saint. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Jesus said that. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. St. Paul says, this is the will of your heavenly Father, your sanctification. Mother Teresa says this, holiness is not a privilege of the few, it is a duty of all. So for, if we want to get to heaven, we have to become saints. That being the case, that being the case, <clears throat> today we celebrate this saint. And I'm going to give you a hint who she is. This saint that we celebrate today also had a brother who was a saint. And the brother who was a saint, they were actually twins. How about that? This is about the only twins, I think, that we know that are actually canonized saints. There may be others, but these are the only twins I know that are canonized saints. Do you know who they are? I should give you a minute to think. They were born in 480. Okay, I'll tell you who. So you've got it. It is Saint Scholastica, who happens to be the sister of Saint Benedict. So today we celebrate Saint Scholastica, who happens to be the sister 
of Saint Benedict. What do we know about her? Well, we know about who, her through her brother, Saint Benedict. How do we know about Saint Benedict? The chief or primary edu uh, knowledge we have <coughs> of St. Benedict comes from St. Gregory. St. Gregory the Great, who was a pope, was also a Benedictine. And he lived around the time of St. Benedict. So, St. Gregory the Great wrote a work called Dialogues. And in this we have the life of St. Benedict. And in that there's a chapter of what the relationship between St. Benedict and St. Scholastic, a very charming story, which you can read in the Liturgy of the Hours. So uh, for us to really get to know the church, it's important that we have some idea of who St. Benedict was and, of course, his sister, St. Saint, Saint Scholastica. St. Benedict and St. Scholastica were, were son and daughter of a noble family who lived near Rome. Yeah, and one of you point out that he's the patron saint of Europe. That's true. And um, so St. Benedict was brought up and raised with Scholastica. And uh, Benedict wanted to get a good education. So Benedict went to the one of the key centers of education back in the... Um, 500s, and it was Rome. But after being in Rome, for a relatively short time, Benedict was disgusted because there was so much immorality in Rome, so many sins that were being committed. So Benedict decided to give up his studies, and he fled Rome, and he decided to go and situate himself in a place outside of Rome named Subiaco. Subiaco. And he was living a life of prayer and penance, and he was a holy man, and a group of monks wanted him to become it, their, their abbot. He accepted, but he was so demanding that they end up by really disliking him, they tried to poison him. So Benedict moved from Subiaco to Monte Cassino. And there in Monte Cassino, he established what is called the Benedictine Order. And the Benedict Order was established to promote prayer as well as work. The motto of St. Benedict would be Ora e Labora. And Ora Labora means pray and work. Now, St. Benedict was famous for many things. But especially, he's most famous for the fact that he wrote what is called the Religious Monastic Rule. In other words, the rules of monks and, and priests, religious priests, have as their foundation the rule of St. Benedict which is very orderly, very methodic, a lot of common sense. 
But having a rule is a good way, as Ignatius would say, to order the disorder. Because of a, a, as a result of original sin, we all have disorders in our lives. A rule helps to order the disorder. So St. Benedict founded the Benedictines and as well as he wrote a rule. So as a result of that, St. Benedict is known as the father of Western monasticism. And St. Scholastica is known as the, uh, I'm sorry, St. Anthony of the Desert is known as the father of Eastern monasticism. <clears throat> Okay, how do we know then, what do we know about St. Uh, Scholastica? Well, she followed her brother. She had the same inspiration that she wanted to live a, a life of deep prayer. So, a few miles from the convent, or monastery of St. Benedict in Monte Cassino, Scholastica set up a monastery for women. So she would have been most likely the superior of the women's branch of the Benedictines. And her brother, St. Benedict, helped her to set this up. Now, the very little that we know from her is from the Dialogues of St. Gregory, and you can find it in the Liturgy of the Hours. If you pray the breviary, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Office of Readings is a charming story. A charming story, which I'd like to just uh, recount for your own edification. And it's this. You probably maybe you know that the the Benedictine monks, uh, the Benedictine monks, as well as the the nuns, have taken vows of poverty, chaste, and obedience, but also stability. Now, stability means that they are. They make a vow to stay within their monastery. For example, I'm a religious. I'm an oblate of the, Vir of the Virgin Mary, but I have, I have a, a mixed life. I'm a contemplative in action. So I live in my, I live in the, so to speak, like uh, like a monastery, a rectory with other priests. But I go out. Not because of pandemic, I'm I'm more of a hermit because of the pandemic. But before I would I was telling the people my life used to be before seventy percent outside the house and thirty percent in the inside the house. Now I'm spending seventy percent in the house and thirty percent outside the house because I'm an active priest. I'm a contemplative in action, <clears throat> whereas they are a purely contemplative, they're contemplative, and they live a monastic life, and they have to live in their cell. And various times during the day, they, get, they go to the choir in which they pray. They pray the liturgy of the hours. Sometimes they'll they'll chant the hymns, chant the chant the hymns as well as the the psalms. So Saint Benedict allowed for an exception to the rule, and it was this: once a year, Benedict would leave his monastery. And he would go to the sisters' convent 
And on their property, there was like a, I think somewhat like a farmhouse outside the monastery. And the nuns would welcome St. Benedict and his brothers to visit them once a year. Just one day a year, that was it. Because uh, they had to be very, St. Benedict's rule, very strict in the importance of silence and solitude and living in their cell. Because in their cell, they ha there was silence and the science they were able to, to talk to God, to cultivate a really deep prayer life. So the day arrived for the visit, and um, so St. Benedict arrives at the... Um, destination and he meets and greets his sister as well as the other sisters that are there and they're dressed as monks so what do they do they basically three things they pray together they have a leisurely meal together and then Benedict, the brothers, and the sisters, they have a long, lively conversation on spiritual topics. And I like that. Wouldn't it be beautiful if in our families we're able to talk about God? Often what we do as priests when we have lunch, we talk about God. We talk about other things too. We tell stories, we tell jokes, but we talk about God. We almost always talk about the, the reading, the gospel reading for today, as well as the first reading. We, we have a conversation on what it says to us. You know, St. Philip Neri, who found, founded the Oratory, part of the dynamic of the Oratorian priests is come together sing, pray, and then talk about God. Talk about uh, religious, spiritual topics. Now that Family should try to do that. Not to say it's easy. But maybe when you have your dinner together, maybe uh, after you pray, uh, you might even ask, ask your family members, who is God for you? What, uh, you might even ask, what uh, passage in the Bible do you like best? You might ask your family members, what saint do you like best? You might say, what virtue do you like best? Just open up the door with a very simple, general conversation as such. And share. Such that you're enriching yourself by talking about God. How easy we can talk about food and clothing and politics. And often we're complaining wouldn't it be better, more enriching, to talk about God? Jesus says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you really love God, you should want to talk about God and share God with others. So when, you're, when, you, when you share God, you actually become more, you become more enriched with God himself. So learn, pray for the grace to be able to talk about God. So if you're meditating, you're reading, you're filling yourself with God, then you want you should want to give God to others. <clears throat> All right. So um, going back to the encounter between Benedict Scholastica and uh, the nuns and the monks. So they're having a lively conversation, they're praying, they're talking about spiritual topics, and what happens is the sun is going down, and Benedict turns to Scholastic and says, okay, we got to go. It's time to go. So Scholastica 
even though the sun has gone down and the rule is that Bendik has to get up and go with his brothers to return to his monastery so that they're in their, their, they arrive at their cells at night. Scholastica says, please, brother, stay. Stay with us. Spend longer time with us talking about spiritual things. Feeding our souls by your love and conversation. Benedict looked at, looks at Scholastica and she, he's almost scandalized. Sister, how dare you? We have to get back to our convent. We have to get back to our monastery. We have to be in our cell at a certain hour. So what happened was this. Scholastica put her head on the table and she start, she did this. And what she did was she prayed to God <clears throat> that Benedict would spend more time with her and his brothers would spend time with her and the nuns talking more about God. She was hoping talk about, talk about God through the whole night. And you know what happened? You know what happened was this. There was peals of lightning and a loud storm and then a downpour of rain. Rain started to descend in buckets upon where they were where they were presently conversing. And then Saint Scholastica said, Well, my brother, if you if you like, you can leave now. You can leave now. And then Benny said, oh, Scholastica, may God forgive you for what you've done. May God forgive you for what you've done, my sister. So they can't leave because the rain is coming down so strong. It's impossible to get up and leave. Otherwise, they're going to be drenched and they'll get probably sick on the way back to their own monastery so what do they do they talk about god the whole night the whole night they're engrossed in spiritual conversation until the dawning of a new day and i think we should pray for the grace to really want really have a great desire to be able to talk about God. To form good spiritual friendships so we could talk about God. And that's what we invite you to do when you're going to be doing your consecration to Mary. Every week, maybe connect with someone and talk to someone about your, your, your meditation. Talk to someone about what are the insights you've given as you're getting to know and love Mary more. And Mary brings us to Christ. <clears throat> so finally, as the new day dawns and the rain stops, Benedict says goodbye to his sister and to the nuns. And what happens is this. Possibly St. Scholastica knew that God was going to call her to himself in a short time. Benedict, re Benedict returns to his cell. And three days later, three, day la three days later,
Ben looks out the window of his cell. What does he see? He sees this beautiful white dove outside his window. This white dove was flying in the sky to heaven. What was that? His sister died. So his twin sister died and she, symbolic of the dove, flew right to heaven. Flew right to heaven. According to studies, she was probably about 67 years of age. But that was the last time she saw her husband, her, her husband, her brother, until he got to heaven. Now, after she died, Benedict opened the tomb where he wanted to be buried. So the body of St. Scholastic was transported to where Benedict was to be buried. Then when he died, he was buried right next to his sister. And I'm pretty sure I have to look into this, but I'm pretty sure that they're buried in Monte Cassino, which is new, not too far from the city of Rome. And Monte Cassino would be the mother house of the Benedictines. So really, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful story. A beautiful story. <clears throat> and um, when I talk about the lives of the saints, I like to, I like to draw conclusions and lessons that we can pray over. And there are many. And the first lesson is the following. That all of us are called to become saints. And we should strive, we should strive for holiness of life. Second is this, is that Saint Scholastic and Benedict were brother and sister. And they helped each other to become saints. Let's pray that brothers and sisters would not fight with each other. But brothers and sisters would try to help each other to become saints. That brothers and sisters would not be stumbling blocks toward holiness. But rather that they would be stepping stones, ladders by which others, their brothers and sisters can ascend the ladder of holiness. The third is that St. Benedict fled from Rome because of the very immoral environment of Rome. I think that teaches us, my friends, that we should flee from the near occasion of sin. Because he who plays with fire is going to get burnt. When we go to confession, we say, I will try to avoid any person, place, or thing, which is a near occasion of sin to me. He who plays with fire is going to get burnt. Another lesson, another lesson is that Benedict fled from a sinful environment so that he could find refuge with God in silence, in silence. 
My friends, silence is important because silence is indispensable for us to have a prayer life. For that reason, you make your holy hour, it's a time of silence, but like St. Benedict and St. Scholastica, you can encounter God in silence. Do you remember when Elijah fled for his life and he arrived at the holy mountain? He did not encounter God in the noise, but he encountered God in the silent breeze. So we will encounter God in silence. And then the, the motto of the Benedictines is Ora e Labora, which is work, it is pray and work. Let us pray fervently, but also we're called to work. Let us pray fervently, but also we are called to work. St. Paul says, to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. In the final lesson that we can learn from St. Scholastic and St. Benedict is, of course, the importance of prayer. But it's also important in establishing spiritual friendships in which you have a friend in which you're able to share spiritual things. St. Scholastic and St. Benedict, they shared spiritual treasures. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're going to make the consecration to Mary, it's a good idea to keep to do at least once a year. Maybe on Zoom or maybe on by means of telephone or FaceTime. You can maybe at least once a week share with another person or persons your riches, your insights. So how beautiful it really is. How beautiful it really is for us to meditate upon the lives of the saints. All right. So let's move from St. Scholastica to reading of the book of Genesis. Okay, what we have in the book of Genesis now is Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the first two chapters of the first book of the Bible, speaks about creation. God is the creator. God creates, and by creation it means that God brings something that doesn't exist into existence. And God creates, he's omnipotent by simply his word. When God said, let there be light, light existed. When God said, let there be darkness, darkness existed. When God said, let the sun exist, the sun began to exist. When God said, let the moon exist, the moon existed. When God said, let the immense oceans exist, the world was filled with immense bodies of water. Let the ocean be filled with different sea animals. All the different sea world animals existed. When God said, let the earth be filled with trees, 
trees came into existence. So God, be, by creating, he brings something out of nothing. There we see the power of God. Now, why does God create? God creates out of love. Out of love. God had no necessity to create. He did it simply out of love. And everything in creation, <clears throat> now the, the crown of creation, the high point of creation, is the creation of man and woman. God created man and woman in his image and likeness. But everything else that God created, God created as an act of love for the benefit of man and woman. So that we as men and women, utilizing properly all of creation, we utilize all of creation as a means by which we can arrive at the Creator. And in a certain sense, Everything that God created was good. In God is wisdom, in God is power, in God is beauty. Behind the beauty of creation is the Creator. That's why it's a good idea to take a nature walk. And when you're looking at the beauty of nature, whatever it might be, whatever captivates you, you should go from the creation, the beauty of creation, to the creator itself. In the Psalms, the Psalms speak about the beauty of nature. The beauty of nature. Everything in nature is beautiful. Everything. But man and woman is the crown of creation. So after God creates, God creates the world, the animals, everything in the world. Then God is going to create man and woman. Today in the in the, the reading says that man was created by the clay of the earth. So God takes the clay of the earth that he created and he forms from that clay of the earth a man. So man was first to be created from the clay of the earth and it says that God blew the breath of life into that man. What does that mean that God actually breathed? God breathed, God blew the breath of life into man. That's man's soul. So the clay is symbolic of the body of man, but God breathes. The breath of God is the soul of man. So there you have the composite nature of man and woman both body and soul, we are a composite being composed of two different elements, the material, the clay, the body, and then the breath would be our soul. So we're created in the, in the image and likeness of God. And then God, God tells Adam, Adam which means taken from the earth. He shows that Adam has dominion over the animals. Because Adam is called to name each of those animals. <clears throat> God has given that as one of the responsibilities of Adam is to name the animals. 
And God is going to have a beautiful garden, and God is going to ask Adam to till the garden, to cultivate the garden of Eden. And even though Adam is happy, there's no sin, there's no evil, because there's no sin in the world, he's totally happy. But God is going to tell Adam, and what happens you hear in the, the reading today, very beautiful that these trees are going to spring forth. And the Bible says the trees are very beautiful. Beautiful to the eyes. Everything that God creates. God creates beauty. Pray for the grace to be able to see the beauty of God in his creation. God is the author of beauty. So these arbol, these arbol, these trees are are growing up, they're sprouting, and they're producing. They're producing fruit. It's interesting. We met this yesterday, that the first command that God gives in the Bible is be fruitful and multiply. In other words, God does not like sterility. God likes fertility. God likes growth. God likes people. God, like, God likes variety. Be fruitful and multiply. So that's the, that's the first command of God. Be fruitful and mu multiply. Trees, animals, but he's going to say also among human persons, be fruitful and multiply. Now in the reading today, God also gives to Adam, and Eve does not come onto the scene yet. Adam is first created, then Eve is going to be taken from the rib of Adam when he's placed in a profound sleep. You probably know the story. But God tells Adam that he, he's called to cultivate to till the land, and it's not difficult. <clears throat> Then God says to Adam, of all these trees that I have produced and the fruits that are blossoming forth on the trees, you can eat all the different fruits on the different fruit trees in the garden. But now God gives Adam one prohibition. There's only one tree and its fruit I don't want you to touch. And not to, I don't want you to touch or eat. And that was the tree in the middle of the garden whose name was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The last verse today says, you should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good, good and evil. Then God says, if you do, you are surely doomed to die. Wow, that's pretty serious. So there were probably many, 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 many trees with wonderful fruits. God made one simple prohibition. Not to eat from one tree, one fruit, and that was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the middle of the garden. And if Adam ate from that, God said he would surely, surely doom to die. In other words, God was telling Adam that he had to obey. How important it is, my friends, that we learn the importance of obeying. So, my friends, we've had a wonderful conversation today, and tomorrow, as I mentioned to you, 
in our Thursday conversation. We're going to be starting just on Thursdays, our mini course of consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.